A.A. Ron. Where is A.A. Ron right now? A.A. Ron is right here as always. Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Guys, did you know that Scientology can't really sue anybody anymore? This is something that's been kind of evident over the last many years when you've had things like the book Going Clear by Lawrence Wright, the HBO documentary Going Clear by Alex Gibney based on the book, uh, Leah Remini's book, Troublemaker, uh, the entirety of the three seasons of the Scientology and the Aftermath show. All of these things have occurred without a single lawsuit against an individual, a company, an organization from Scientology, zip nada. This came up over the weekend in a blog post that Mike Rinder did uh, over on his blog called Panic Stations in the Bubble, A Billion Years is Coming. Now, A Billion Years is Mike's book that's actually coming out tomorrow. And the very fact that Mike was able to write this book, get a publisher for the United States, get a publisher for uh, the United Kingdom, where by the way, the libel laws in the United Kingdom are much, it's much easier to sue someone successfully for libel and slander uh, in the Commonwealth than it is uh, in the United States. And historically, it's been harder to find publishers for you know UK and Australia, for example, than in the US for that reason. And yet Mike Rinder was able to secure publication and distribution without any problems. And he said on his blog, the imminent release of a billion years has Scientology doing things they have not done before. It's all hands panic stations in OSA. OSA is Office of Special Affairs. It's the department within Scientology that handles all the legal issues, hiring lawyers, harassing critics and former members and all that kind of stuff. He says these days their legal threats fall on deaf ears. Everyone knows they cannot file lawsuits, not just because what is said is true, but because Miscavige cannot afford to go into deposition and be exposed for what he really is. This factor cannot be overstated. This fact alone prevents Scientology from being able to sue people. I asked Mike more about this over the weekend and he explained to me, uh, by the way, of course I'm talking about Mike Rinder, co-host of the Scientology, Leah Remini Scientology and the Aftermath television program. Mike Rinder is also on the board of the Aftermath Foundation with me. We help people who are escaping from Scientology and starting new lives from scratch. So we were having brunch over the weekend and Mike explained that in a lot of these lawsuits that are currently ongoing against Scientology, one of the ways Miscavige avoids being deposed in these cases, even when he is successfully served with papers, which itself is uh, very difficult these days, but even in the cases when he has been served, one of the ways he avoids being deposed is that in the eyes of the law, when you have someone who's kind of sitting at the very top of an organization, it's easy uh, to claim that the lawsuits or the effort to specifically depose Miscavige in the lawsuits is some kind of harassment. To a certain extent, there are protections in place to prevent heads of organizations from being forced to be deposed in lawsuits against the organization. However, the same protections or assumptions would not be in place if Scientology were the aggressor, if they were the ones filing suit against someone else. Miscavige is known and does publicly describe himself as the leader of the Scientology religion. So if Scientology goes out and sues a former member or a whistleblower or a critic, Miscavige can't say, oh, this lawsuit is just harassment and I should be protected from that harassment. And Mike said, this is why Scientology does not sue anyone. And in fact, hasn't sued anyone in decades with one major exception. And that exception went very, very badly for Scientology. And that exception was Debbie Cook. And the fallout for David Miscavige and Scientology from trying to sue Debbie Cook back in 2012 is the other reason why Scientology does not sue people anymore. So let me tell you what happened with Debbie Cook. Debbie Cook is someone who was born and raised in Scientology and from a very young age started working directly from, for L. Ron Hubbard and eventually became one of the most well-known and well-respected managers in all of Scientology. Now, the worst thing you can do in Scientology is to accumulate uh, respect and power because once you do, Miscavige sees you as a threat. Once Miscavige sees you as a threat, he figures out how to take you out. One way Miscavige takes people out is to promote someone up to a level where he can now blame them for everything that was already going wrong at that level or, or within that level's sphere of influence. And that is exactly what he did with Debbie Cook. In 2007, he promoted her from her position as captain of flag and he brought her up to Scientology's international management base where Debbie Cook was now seeing for the first time how David Miscavige had personally dismantled and destroyed the entire 
international management structure of Scientology. And he was now basically tasking Debbie with kind of being one of his fixers, helping him fix everything that he had destroyed up at Int Management. Debbie's experience working directly for David Miscavige for just a matter of months, I don't know, six months or something like that, was so horrible that she went from dedicating her entire life to the service of Scientology to saying, I wanna leave staff altogether. And in 2007, Debbie and Wayne kind of quietly left Scientology. And for years, they kept quiet, they kept their heads down. They were being good little Scientologists. They didn't wanna upset Miscavige. They didn't wanna you know, make a big fuss. And then on New Year's Eve, 2011, so we're talking December 31st, 2011, Debbie Cook sent out an email to essentially every Scientologist in the world saying that how David Miscavige has been running Scientology over the last many years is completely contrary to everything L. Ron Hubbard said should be done. And again, this email went out to all Scientologists in the world and Miscavige could not let that stand. So he, Miscavige and Scientology, sued Debbie Cook saying she violated the non-disclosure agreement that she signed when she left Scientology staff. Scientology filed for a temporary restraining order against her, which given the laws of Texas, the, the temporary restraining order is granted under the assumption that the filing is correct. But since that is technically a violation of someone's rights, there's a hearing that has to be held no more than 10 days after the issuing of the temporary restraining order to determine whether the TRO is going to be thrown out or whether it's going to be upheld uh, for the duration of the suit. Now this lawsuit from Scientology never made it past the preliminary hearing because Debbie's testimony at this hearing was so horrendously damning uh, for Scientology and specifically for David Miscavige that Scientology instantly caved and said, please give this woman millions of dollars to just stop talking and go away. And the entire issue was settled. This thing never made it to court. And this is, this is why, this is the second reason why Scientology simply can't afford to sue anybody anymore. It's Miscavige can't afford to be deposed and they can't afford to have any more testimony like this. I wanna play for you four and a half minutes of what Debbie Cook said on the stand in the hearing about this temporary restraining order. Year 2005, what was the first thing that you witnessed that personally horrified and frightened you? I um, witnessed Mr. Miscavige physically um, punching in the face and wrestling to the ground another very senior um, executive at Scientology International level. Did you ever begin to receive, uh, or were you ever the recipient of any violence? Yes, I was. One time I was uh, called into a conference room and asked some questions, and he ordered his, his secretary to slap me, and she um, slapped me so hard I fell, fell over into the chairs. Um, one time, he, uh, Mr. Miscavige ordered his communicator to break my finger if I didn't answer uh, his question. Do you yourself ever receive physical violence from Mr. Miscavige? Um, I, there was really only one physical incident where um, he was very angry and he, um, walked around a, a long, very long conference table to get to me. He was yelling and um, he came up like as if he was going to choke me, but he didn't. He only, he basically grabbed my shoulders and, and shook me while he was yelling at me. Let's talk about how you ended up in the hole. You told us that the hole consisted of a couple of, I think, double wide trailers. Yes. Um, what made it a hole, rather the hole, rather than a couple of double wide trailers that people were living in? Describe it for us. Um, it had bars on the windows, and the one entrance was guarded by security 24 hours a day, um, and. It contained in it, at the time that I went into the hole in May of 2007, there was over 100 top 
um, Scientology International executives that had been put there. And the, the whole basically was some kind of a slang term that had been coined long before I got there. And um, uh, it was where you actually, you ate there, you slept there on the floor, um, and you know you never left with the exception of a brief period to go take a shower and come back. When you say slept there on the floor, did you have cots or bunks or some kind of beds? No, you, you slept in a, you were given a sleeping bag, you slept on the floor in a sleeping bag. And what were the conditions like on the, on the floor to sleep? Well, there were um, ants. The place was infested by ants, so ants would crawl on you. And there was a, a, a two-week period during that time when all the electricity had been shut off um, as ordered by Mr. Miscavige. And this was, of course, in summer in the desert. And so the temperature in there was about 106. Why didn't you just take off and get away from the hole? It's not possible. It's absolutely not physically possible. We couldn't make it past security. The, the, the windows were barred. Um, right from the beginning when I went in, I, I obviously was trying to figure out, plotting how to, how to get out. Were you used to, in your life, getting beaten up? Was that something you were used to? No, never. And you were a 40-something-year-old woman with a very, very respected job. Yes. I mean, that is wild. And actually, the first day of the hearing, my understanding is that the first day, there weren't cameras in. Cameras in were allowed on the second, and there might even have been a third day of the hearing. But here is some of what the Tampa Bay Times reported that I think wasn't captured on camera. They reported, Scientology executive Debbie Cook was on the phone with church leader David Miscavige when she heard someone pounding at her office door at a church compound in California, not wanting to hang up on her angry boss who was complaining about a performance. She didn't answer the knocks. The pounding stopped, but someone was prying open her office window. Two male church employees crawled in, are they there? Miscavige asked. Yes, Cook answered. Goodbye, the church leader said. I mean, it's like you couldn't script a better villain moment in a movie. The men took Cook away to a place called The Hole, two double-wide trailers on the church's 500-acre California compound, where other high-ranking church defectors have told the Tampa Bay Times Miscavige sent underperforming executives. The windows were covered with bars and security guards controlled the only exit, Cook said. Okay, so she mentioned that also in the testimony that we just watched, but this is the story of how she was actually informed that she was being taken to the hole. Now, the purpose of this testimony was, remember, Scientology was saying, you violated your non-disclosure by sending out that email. And Debbie's argument was that non-disclosure was signed under duress. And part of what was uh, explained in the first day of the hearing was, was how exactly this thing was signed under duress. And the Tampa Bay Times says, Cook testified Thursday that the experience in the summer of 2007 gave her nightmares and was part of the reason she was so eager to leave the Scientology staff later that year and sign a severance agreement never to speak ill of the church. I would have signed that I stabbed the babies over and over again and loved it. I would have done anything basically at that point, she said during her several hours of sworn testimony in uh, the San Antonio District Court. So her testifying about how horrible her experience was while working directly for Miscavige spoke directly to the heart of the issue of why and how she would have been willing to say anything, do anything, sign anything to be allowed to actually leave. Now, amazingly, this exact same fact is at the heart of the issue of a current civil lawsuit against Scientology, which David Miscavige is also personally named in, being brought by uh, Gawain Baxter, Laura Bas Baxter, and Valeska Paris, three former Sea Org members from Australia who are suing because they were trafficked as children for labor on Scientology's cruise ship, the Free Winds. And even though these guys are suing for something as egregious as child labor trafficking, Scientology is still saying, you guys signed these agreements, not only these non-disclosure agreements, but in particular, you guys signed agreements 
to never sue Scientology and to always take any complaints to internal arbitration. And the argument at play in that lawsuit is the same as Debbie's, which is those agreements were all signed under duress. And one of the reasons this lawsuit is so incredibly important is because if a court rules that those agreements were signed under duress, it would be the first ruling any court has made against Scientology in that matter. Technically, this Debbie Cook suit, remember, there was no judicial ruling on this issue. The suit never even made it past the hearing stage. Scientology settled with her before Debbie had even finished her testimony. They literally took a break, they took a recess, they made an offer, they made a deal. So there's no ruling that says Debbie Cook's forms were signed under duress. And yet the damage that Scientology, uh, and Miscavige in particular, took reputationally based on just the limited testimony that we did get from Debbie Cook, this cannot be overstated. That particular type of damage and the fact that Miscavige will do anything to prevent himself from being deposed is why there is virtually no risk of being sued by Scientology these days, which is remarkable when you think about it. Because Scientology, one of its biggest reputations is being litigious. It's got this huge reputation for suing its enemies into oblivion. And I'm willing to bet that until right now, you probably thought that Scientology was still able to get away with that. And you probably didn't know that they actually haven't sued anyone or anything like a, you know, a company, an organization in decades now, other than Debbie Cook, and look how poorly that went for them. So this is great news for whistleblowers, former members, critics, media organizations. I mean, I don't wanna say there's nothing to be afraid of. Scientology will still figure out how to harass you, make your life as difficult as possible, try to play psychological warfare with you, try to mess with your friendships, your business relationships. It's not like there's no risk. For sure there is risk, but the one thing there is almost no risk of is an actual lawsuit and the more corporate attorneys uh, particularly on the media side of things understand that the better it will be for everyone so that's all i have on this stay tuned guys for updates on all of these civil suits and the criminal cases regarding scientology and prominent scientologists uh, quick reminder i do live in clearwater there's a chance we're going to get spanked by a hurricane this week so hopefully we don't hopefully we don't lose power for a couple days Hopefully, uh, if we have an update in any of these cases on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, I'll still be able to bring it to you guys. Fingers crossed. Thank you for watching, everyone. Thank you to everyone who watches until the very end, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, so 